Well, welcome everybody and welcome to the second day of this uh, new Paradigm for New Normal conference. We had uh, over 250 participants yesterday, which is a great number. We have a little uh, fewer today, which is fine because today is really where we are getting down into the weeds and looking at how we can develop a uh, business uh, curricula. Um, you know, uh, preceding this conference, we had a number of people who kind of had been meeting weekly uh, in preparation for this, uh, for this conference. So I'm extremely grateful and on behalf of the co-chairs to all the leads for the different, uh, for the different disciplines. So before we begin uh, today's program, I would like to ask Father Kavanaugh to lead us in prayer. Lord, we know you stand with us, especially in this time when we're facing so many crises around the globe. You see us trying to do something about that, Lord. We know that you applaud our efforts and we ask that you stand with us even more in the coming months as we try to indeed change the way we teach, change business education, and ultimately to change our attitudes towards our fellow human beings and towards this globe that we live in. We ask you once again to stand with us, support us, and know you love us through Christ our Lord. Thank you for the governor. So our first panel really today is on uh, developing uh, business uh, curricula. And I'm going to ask Father uh, Garanzini, whom you all know, and, who's a, and for those who don't know him, he's the Secretary for Higher Education of the Society of Jesus and the Chair of the International Association of Jesuit Universities to begin um, with his presentation. Father Garanzini? Thank you. Am I on? Thank you, Nikki. Um, we had a rich day yesterday for those of you that were with us. Um, and uh, it was something of the, uh, the Jesuit uh, Ignatian paradigm for education that was embedded in the format of our program. You know, um, the, the, the paradigm goes simply like this, and many of you know what it is. Uh, uh, we start out with the world we're given. We start out with uh, the reality that we face in all of its good points and, and its wrinkles, all the, the things that are deficient about it. And Jeffrey Sachs started us out yesterday with, um, I think, a really uh, global picture of the economic challenges that we face, the environmental challenges that we face, how these things are intertwined, and the leadership challenge that we face. And we asked ourselves throughout the day, how do we engage that? You know, how does business engage that? And how does business education help young people engage that? And once we do, what do we experience when we engage that? What's the, what, what comes from that? How does it affect us? How does it, how does it strike us? And was our initial expectation fulfilled? Um, is, are things worse? Are things better? Are things more complicated, more complex? And usually that's what we find. If we get, as we engage reality and engage the, the world, we find that it's more complex than we thought. And finally, what does that say about our approach and our commitment going forward to make the world a better place? So that, that's something of the, the uh, Ignatian pedagogical paradigm. And that's what we try to do in courses. You know, here's the reality, here's, here's what we know. Uh, we invite the students to engage that somehow. Often we want things to be very practical, we want things to be tangible, we want to get them involved. And then we ask them to reflect on it and, uh, and, and ask themselves, what does this do to you? What is this, how does this impact you? And how does this affect what you thought previously to engaging it? How does this contribute to a better, more clear, a more rich understanding of the reality and the problems that need to be solved or need to be engaged. Um, and, and then finally, does this tell us something about re-engaging the reality in a new way? Um, that's where we are uh, with this entire issue of uh, uh, the COVID-19 and just really COVID, as I think as several people said yesterday, COVID-19 actually just accelerated things that we knew were, were happening already. 
the inequalities that we experience uh, among and between people, among and between nations, the, uh, the, the, uh, the, the interconnectedness of all of our reality, from our health to our food supply to its in, in, in our economic um, uh, systems. So um, what we wanna do today is we wanna look at curriculum development. How do we develop curriculum that actually do what our present curricula are not able to do or seem inadequate to do? Uh, open the world to different ways of seeing reality, seeing our economic systems, seeing our financial systems, seeing our marketing, and seeing our, all, of the, all the aspects of, of a business education. How do we open the world? How do we help students engage the world? And how do we, in fact, help them think about how they'd like to contribute to making the world a better place uh, through, through their studies um, and, and through their commitment to become a business leader. Uh, what we have, uh, two of the panelists that, I, if, if, that's, if it's okay, I'd like to introduce you to two of our panelists today, um, Michael Shook and Nancy Tuckman. They're colleagues of mine from Loyola University, Chicago, and I, I know that there are, there are great professors all over the place. These are two great professors, two, two great educators, and we could have selected from many, but I selected these two because of a particular project that they've been involved in. Uh, the project, uh, Dr. Nancy Tuckman is Dean of the Institute for Environmental Sustainability at Loyola, and Michael Shook is a theologian uh, who has also been very interested in the church's teachings around social justice, so, and who, who is, who's made that his career. The two of them have led a project, and it's, we're in probably eight years, I'm gonna guess, now of this project, uh, where we have looked at uh, how to educate young people, so we're talking about our college freshmen, how to educate them uh, in the area of environmental sustainability, but not just the science of environmental sustainability, but all of the, the issues that it raises, and the, the, not only the, the, the ethical issues and the social issues, but the spiritual issues. Uh, how is it that you as a person uh, could be personally engaged by the environmental struggle, the struggle to, to create a better, uh, more sustainable environment. How is it that you personally are going to be able to do that? This project of creating a textbook to introduce freshmen to environmental sustainability studies was a project that involved many professors because it's an interdisciplinary textbook. It's an online textbook because we wanted to make this textbook available to people, students all over the world, in, especially in the Jesuit system. And we wanted to engage them and we wanted to build it around the, uh, the um, Ignatian paradigm that I just described of engaging reality, committing oneself to uh, act in that reality, reflecting on that reality, and then determining what does that say to me and to us about how we move forward with this, how we make, in this, sense, in this case, how we make the, the environment more sustainable. So I'm going to ask them to talk about that project uh, because I think it's instructive. Uh, there's, there's, a, there's a lot of work and there's a lot that we've learned through creating an online textbook that could be global. So we had to we had to pull out um, we had to, we had to look carefully at cultural dispositions towards the material uh, towards looking at things from from a particular one sided point of view and so we've we've had to work a lot on making that textbook globally accessible and uh, rich in terms of its its um, uh, examples um, so I'll let them talk about that. Uh, themselves, but it's a, it's just an example of how to begin thinking about changing the educational uh, materials that we use, so that we're 
we're actually teaching in ways that are kind of counter to what the academy presently you you know uh, presently offers textbooks with a particular slant that are fact based that may be rich in examples but presume that the discipline needs to be tightly constrained and but that's not how students want to want to receive the discipline and want to see see reality reality isn't discipline focused reality is multidisciplinary as as we all know and the problems that we're facing all require a multidisciplinary approach so can i turn this back over to to you guys and we can move on with the panel great Thank you, Father. Um, I'm going to start this presentation and then hand it off to my colleague, Mike Shook. Uh, Mike is screen sharing. So um, I, I just want to acknowledge Father Guerin. He was president here at Loyola University Chicago School in Environmental Sustainability. So he really fostered that and facilitated it and made it happen. Um, and the whole idea of Healing Earth, this textbook that we're going to show you, brainchild, and he's been also the one that's um, underwritten the whole project and, and really brought a lot of people rich from rich different disciplines to make this thing happen. So it's really exciting to work with you. And, um, we just love that we continue to work with you. We no longer at Loyola. So thank you for that. Um, let me start by uh, describing um, the interdisciplinarity of uh, environmental science. So this Venn diagram shows you that at its core, environmental science is the study of ecology, which is, is really uh, based in biology and chemistry. It's a science. It's, it's the study of nature and natural ecosystems. But the difference between ecology and environmental science is that environmental science incorporates all of these uh, human dimensions that you can see in the circles around the Venn diagram. So all of these things put together is what we call environmental science. And um, the Institute of Environmental Sustainability is made of faculty who have PhDs in all of these different disciplines. So we have a core faculty who are ecologists, but then we have as many faculty that are from all of these other disciplines. Their PhDs are in those disciplines, and yet their tenure home is in the Institute of Environmental Sustainability. And I, I say this because of its importance in how we work as an interdisciplinary team to develop our curriculum. So our entire curriculum has perspectives and input from all of these different people. Um, and it's highly interdisciplinary, and I think that really makes it rich, and it is also about integrating these different disciplines into this big audacious problem to help our students understand all the different perspectives that are involved, not only in the problem, but in the solution and in the new paradigm that we're trying to develop. And here you can see if we shrink the Institute of Environmental Sustainability down into the center and then connect us with all the other schools or just you know, kind of a handful I've shown here on this slide, but other schools within the university, you can see um, how rich it is as a platform for interdisciplinary programming across schools. And um, we really have a great relationship, I would say, with Loyola's School of Business that's chaired by Kevin Stevens and a lot of really dynamic faculty there who understand the connection between business and environment and, and are willing to work with us across these schools to build programming. Um, we've launched two minors together. We have a minor in business sustainability and another one in ecological economics that um, are thriving and now we're working on majors and master's programs. Um, so I, I just wanted to kind of put this up as the context of where Healing Earth, this environmental science textbook, um, was originated. Um, next slide, please, Mike. Um, Okay, 
I'll just mention that yesterday, uh, Father Zampini so aptly put it that we are in an economic meltdown or a climate breakdown and a COVID lockdown. Um, each of these is manifesting an even deeper problem, a global crisis of spirituality. Jeffrey Sachs demonstrated how humanity needs a new ethical orientation toward the common good and that that orientation really can start and should start in our schools. In Jesuit higher ed, Father Garanzini suggests that our role isn't just to pass on content or information, but it's really to form character in our youth. It's a big role in formation. So we need to pay attention to what the students are telling us, what they're asking us, and they're saying we need a moral compass. So Jeffrey Sachs suggested Laudato Si would be a great textbook for this whole concept of a new paradigm. Um, Mike, if you'll share the next slide. Um, while Pope Francis was writing his encyclical, teachers from over 30 countries and researchers from 20 different disciplines were designing a textbook called Healing Earth. And again, as Father Garanzini mentioned, this is an online free um, textbook on integral ecology. Healing Earth provides students with this moral compass because it integrates not only the science of these issues, but also the, the um, ethics and spirituality. Mike, I don't know if you can share those slides or you having trouble getting that slide show up or, or not. But anyways, um, I'll just keep moving forward. The, um, the textbook has six different chapters that are really focused on the major environmental science issues that have been um, delineated and identified by the um, United Nations. So uh, I guess your second slide then shows the, the different chapters of the textbook, but what's exciting about these chapters is, is um, the next slide shows how we integrate the science, ethics, spirituality, and action in every chapter. And I think this integration is what the Pope was after, not just giving a direct disciplinary topic and then having the students try to figure out how to integrate what I'm learning in my science classes or my business classes with what I'm learning over here in the humanities department. But we need to integrate this for them. And this is the way the students think anyways. And this is how they want to learn. Um, and so our goal of, of this textbook is really to build integral ecologists. Um, that's our intention, is the formation of integral ecologists. People who are oriented towards the common good, towards sustaining and stewarding natural resources for the benefit of future generations. Um, people who see the connection between the health of the natural world and human wealth and, and uh, human health and well-being. So we, I'm going to let Mike take it now, but just to, just to share our enthusiasm that we've had enormous success reaching students and teachers with this new way of, of teaching environmental science, this new way of integrating ethics and spirituality and action through the Ignatian pedagogy paradigm into environmental science. Um, and Mark, uh, sorry, Mike is going to then show you sort of how this, this textbook has been used by people across the country, across the world. So I'll hand it over to you now, Mike. Mike, if I can interject, can, uh, you're, you're on mute. And one, can you, can you put it on a uh, full slideshow? If you, if you press from current slide, you should get it on uh, the full slideshow. And you are muted. All right, can you see the slide? I think it's probably showing on your other screen. Do you have two screens? Yes. Just leave it as it is then because it's too hard to fix. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Well, um, yeah, sorry about my technological inabilities. <laughs> Yeah, so everybody can hear me at this point? Yes. Okay, I'll be brief. Uh, you know, we just, we wanted to, to take 
educating the whole person from rhetoric to reality. And that's not easy. The rhetoric is easy. The reality we know is, is really a challenge. Uh, and for us, it was how to invite environmental scientists and biologists to move their, um, to invite their students to think about values, um, to engage in personal growth, and to, um, to become agents of, for action. And I'll tell you that several, we went kind of on the road and there were several of our environmental science teachers in Jesuit high schools and elsewhere that said, you know, I don't do that. I teach science. Um, I'm not trained in ethics. Um, I, I have no personal interest in spirituality and how a person acts is their own business. So that was not the majority report. Or may, well, let me put it this way. It kind of was the majority report in North America, but we found in Central and South America more receptivity to ethical and spiritual discussion. Um, so we had to, had to find out a way or solicit people's opinions on a way to invite folks not prone to engage in ethical and spiritual reflection with their students um, to get interested in it. Uh, there were four points that I think we made as we were thinking this through. One is we certainly want to secure our textbook in academic learning, solid science. And um, I think Father Garanzini was slightly nervous that I was involved because I might muck up the science with theology. But we, uh, I think we managed to, to, uh, to, to, to get around that. But anyway, uh, academic learning. And then the second point on, on eth evaluate ethically, we introduced the idea of civic learning. So, uh, you know, it's, I suppose in, in, in the analogy to your discipline, you know, with, with marketing or accounting, you know, what is a civic dimension? Because in the civic dimension, we have to communicate with one another in community, and that involves values and sharing what we, you know, our values. Um, and actually, um, we got a fair, a fairly good reception from environmental science teachers on the civic learning dimension. They like to think what they did, like to think what they do is having us have a bearing on, on, on the community, on civics. Reflect spiritually became, um, personal growth um, education. And, and uh, we actually, you know, spirituality scared a lot of people off because of the connotations with religion and the, and the many long years of debate between religion and science that hasn't been pretty. But um, we, we found it helpful entry point in a, um, the perspective that uh, some of you may be familiar with Ronald Rollheiser. He has a book called The Holy Longing. And in the first two chapters of that book, he talks about spirituality as fundamentally the location of our passions. Very, very Ignatian focus on desire. And so uh, we invited our environmental science teachers to engage, to, to find out what their students desire. And, and where what they're learning in their environmental science class connects with what they desire or doesn't. That, that requires some degree of personal disclosure. So a, 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 a faculty person needs to be ready to talk about their desires. And, um, you know, I, I did all my graduate work at the University of Chicago, and I, that's an institution where there was a 30-foot wall between your personal desires and your academic work. So I know for many scholars, that's just not, that's verboten. Um, but we're pretty confident that it's not in a Jesuit environment, that uh, personal growth is, is important. Uh, and then agency. Now, actually, um, 
this wasn't too hard for our environmental science teachers because they are engaging in labs and maybe outdoor activities where the students are, are really acting in nature. Um, but the idea here is, um, is, is to educate for, for action, educate for agency. The, the thing I would say here is um, that we also had to think about um, two directional teaching or two directional pedagogy that is um, the direction from, um, um, you know, you know all this, planning toward a result, you know, teaching toward a result, and then um, teaching from a result. So we had to think in terms of what our ideal kind of student at the end of a process would look like, a, a student that, that really kind of embraced integral ecology and then work backward from that. And when we worked backward from that, it became really clear that what the pedagogy needs is a lot of um, uh, community engagement. It needs uh, uh, service learning. It needs act, act, engaged learning. It needs these kinds of activities where people are out in the community. And those may not be uh, as apparent when you're, when you're planning forward as they are when you're planning backward. So, uh, you know, I'm not going to uh, go in, uh, go into the text right now, but you can, if you have your iPhone, you can go uh, put up Healing Earth and it'll, it'll pop up. It's very functional on the iPhone. It's about 70% of our users actually are using it on their iPhone. We have about, um, about 20,000 users a month. Uh, I was looking on the analytics uh, this morning and there were, um, there were about 50 people using it at a four o'clock in the morning. And um, most of them were in India. Um, there were six people using it in Helsinki, Finland, and I'd love to know what they were doing. <laughs> uh, anyway, uh, we, we're covering, um, on any given day, somebody's using it in about 130 countries. So we're, we're really excited about that, and we're excited about the, the, the growth of the, of the textbook. But again, our, our main thing has been to try to, try to make real what, could, what educating the whole person could be uh, and give teachers who are not prone to think uh, um, in their empirical fields, particularly ethically and spiritually, to, to allow them to really see how, yes, it does work, um, it can work. Um, I, uh, let me see. Yeah, uh, just a couple testimonials. This is <laughs> from Beatrice, uh, actually in the Basque region. I was, I was um, able to go and visit her and, and several other teachers that use Healing Earth up there. And it's very successful for them because of that connection between science and spirituality. And you know, in the Jesuit high school, there's there's um, really a you know a fairly strong mission to get that that dimension in grade, um, integrated into the curriculum. Um, and the science teachers in Jesuit high schools they tell us you know okay they've been telling me to teach to the mission for 20 years and I don't know what that means in biology. You know how do I teach to the mission? And they'd say we finally got a textbook where at least we can show that we're using it to our, um, to our principal and say, I'm teaching to the mission, so I'm covered. <laughs> uh, also, uh, let's see, um, sorry about this. Uh, Magdalena has been a great Healing Earth user in Poland and, and Krakow. And, and in her case, using the textbook, she says it, it made her think about her view as a scientist and a Catholic, which she had never done in her life. And so, the textbook can have a transformative effect on teachers too. Um, our goal, you know, is, is stated in our introduction, we believe the wisest and most effective response to Earth's urgent ecological challenges will come from people who are scientifically literate, ethically grounded, spiritually aware, and motivated to act. Uh, and I think you could say the the wisest and most effective response to our economic challenges and our business challenges would work the same way. Um, 
So I'm sorry we went over time, but I really appreciate the opportunity to talk to you for a few moments about um, this text that we're so excited about. Mike, Mike, can I ask, uh, talk about uh, the effects in several languages and also how it's used in universities. Can you mention that? Sure, it's in English, French, or English, Portuguese, and Spanish. Uh, the French translation is done. We just have to get it up on the web. Uh, and there's a Chinese translation underway, which is a very wonderful translation, but at the moment we have no idea how to get it on the web, uh, but we'll get there. Uh, uh, and in college, it's used uh, uh, primarily in an introductory courses in environmental science. Uh, uh, it's a modular, it's a modular textbook. So if you're in a theology department, you can start in the spirituality uh, section of the textbook and work toward um, ethics or work toward science. Uh, and uh, adult learning groups in parishes have also used it uh, as a companion to reading um, uh, Laudato Si. Uh, so it's primarily, the primary use has been in upper level uh, AP high school science and in uh, freshman beginning level college uh, environmental science. Thank you. Yep. There, there, are a couple of, there are a couple of questions uh, in the chat, but let me start by, you know, we'll, we'll have a little, little uh, time for questions before we go to the next panelist. Uh, let, me, let me start by asking one uh, question in terms of, you know, how many people were involved in this project and kind of how long, how long will it take for uh, implementation? Do you want to speak to that, Nancy? Um, we, we started in, in we, we, we started in 2010, um, Father Garanzini invited Dr. Tuckman and I to join him to go to Mexico City for the big conference of Jesuit university presidents there. We heard a, a really inspiring speech by Adolfo Nicholas that was actually kind of life changing for me. It was very moving and, uh, but anyway, we can't, that was a, a point in uh, the, when the Jesuits really put a stake in the ground on, on environmental uh, issues and ecological justice and said, we've got to do this. So uh, we get back to Chicago, Father Guernsey calls us into his office and said, how about a living textbook that um, talks about science, but brings in ethics, spirituality and action. And he did, you know, one of the Father Guernsey imagination kind of clouds. And um, we went, Mancy and I left him and went to a coffee shop and said, what the hell is he talking about? Um, well, anyway, we, it, over, the, uh, over a few months, we got about 30 interested faculty from uh, about 10 different countries. And they came to a workshop in Chicago and we got it. We found that there we generated interest and potential and we started with that group. We met again the following year in 2012 uh, with the same group, and it started to uh, span out until uh, by 2013, we had about 150 uh, people in 30 countries contributing. Um, and that was like herding ants, but we, we did it, and, and we launched it finally in 2015. Thanks, that's great. Uh, I see. I see. Nancy is kind of replying to a number of uh, questions in the chat, so I'm not going to repeat those. There was one question uh, earlier on was, uh, you know, that this integral ecology vision is attracting and aligned with transcendent interests. And the question was, you know, do we not also need to include an engineering? And I'm presuming it's somebody who has an engineering background. Mm -hmm. uh, we do have engineers that have helped us design the textbook and a lot of that comes into the action part of it. Um, you know, how can we um, build our our systems, um, our human systems, to be more sustainable and and more in uh, continuity with the environment, rather than you know constantly exploiting the in the environment and reducing resource natural resources and building up toxins and waste. How do we do this in a way that's more sustainable? And really, the engineers have been um, really. Uh, interested and and also very helpful in coming up with sustainable ways to use and reuse resources i mean that's just one way that the engineers have been involved thanks uh 
All right, so uh, we can, you know, if there are more questions, we can come back uh, uh, after, after our next presentation. So I would like to invite uh, Michael Person to uh, kind of introduce our next speaker, Jerry White. Wonderful, well, thank you all. Uh, Jerry White uh, is a, it's a pleasure and an honor to, to introduce him to you. Uh, I put in the chat the uh, Wikipedia entry. I'm not gonna go into depth of all of his accomplishments, but I think the reason why I think he can really help us shape uh, this conversation also is, uh, I would say, unfortunately he didn't go to Jesuit universities, but he seems to be uh, the kind of ideal, quote unquote, student or product of a university that says, we wanna create change makers. What Michael was saying, uh, see scientifically, evaluate ethically, reflect spiritually, and act eff uh, effectively. I think, uh, Jerry, you have done that uh, for many years, and you're helping us as a group also now to advise us. Jerry has, in very young years, had the experience of, of losing his leg uh, in a landmine incident, and then turned that experience into a proactive campaigning mode to ban landmines, been able to work at a very young age uh, with people like-minded, effectively changing the world and getting uh, several uh, treaties signed, working also with the late uh, uh, Princess of Wales, Diana, and, and others. So he received a Nobel Peace Prize for his work and very early on. And so I think he has then since developed uh, insights and capabilities on how we can change the world uh, in various sectors. So we're talking about various disciplines, but I think here the application uh, potentially for us is also how can we create students that can be effective change makers, not only within business or government or the NGO sector, but all throughout. And so the concept that uh, Jerry will talk about a bit more is transpreneurship. He'll share a little bit more about what that would mean. Uh, but I think for you and for us to consider here would be, how can this inform the way we teach students in business uh, as change makers? And, and, and how can we use the uh, Ignatian pedagogy to really advance uh, the ultimate outcome that we create uh, an army, quote unquote, I hate the language of, of uh, military, but uh, the, the uh, equivalent of everyone a change maker. Uh, so Jerry, thank you so much for being with us and over to you. Thank you, Michael. And thank you everyone for the very informative discussions. I've been listening in yesterday and today and proud to be part of this effort. Um, but because I was, I, maybe my grounding in Jesuit was that I was raised an Irish Catholic boy I, south of Boston. Um, so I grew up um, with that ethos. Um, I ended up going to Brown University and became the first sort of Irish Catholic or the first Christian to graduate with a degree in Judaic studies, studying under the very prolific uh, Jacob Neusner. So that's us. But I thought because of the Irish Catholic background, I'd have to start with a bad joke if you'll indulge me. So I just, um, you probably already know it, but it does have a point, I promise. Um, so you, there's this guy who's having this problem and he knocks on the door of a Dominican church and he says, do you pray the rosary here? And the Dominican says, well, yes, of course we're Dominicans. If you give a donation, the guy says, will you say a rosary for an intention I have? And the Dominican says, what's your intention? And the guy says, well, I want a Lexus. And the Dominican says, I don't know what that is. So the guy says, forget it. And he went to ask the Franciscans. So he goes to a Franciscan church and the guy opens up in his brown habit and the man says, will you say a rosary for me if I tell you my intention? And the Franciscan says, sure, I'm happy to do that. What's your intention? And the man says, I want a Lexus. And the Franciscan says, what's that? So the guy decides to go to the Jesuits. So he knocks on the door, the guy opens up. Are you a Jesuit? Yep. Listen, before I go any further, I need to ask you something. Do you know what a Lexus is? And the Jesuit says, do I know what a Lexus is? Cracking up, half my parishioners drive Lexuses. Well, then says the man, will you say a rosary for my intention? And the man asks, if I give you a donation? And the Jesuit says, what's the rosary? <laughs> you probably heard that bad joke, but I say it because I actually believe 
That has been my experience as I've gone around the world, looking at faith-based communities and also at universities, including the greats, you know, in Notre Dame and Georgetown and Fordham, where I'm working with Michael on the Responsible Business Coalition. And I sometimes ask, like, is it really a values? I mean, it's a values crisis, a moral crisis, but what we're facing is fundamentally a spiritual crisis. And we have to understand what is, as I think Nancy said earlier, like, what is that, that compass for us? You know, do we have it? Is that intact in our institutions? So currently I teach at the University of Virginia. And after like, you know, decades of doing activism and negotiating treaties and running around the world like a crazy man, um, I was sort of given this position after serving under uh, President Obama in the State Department that the UVA recruited me to be a professor of practice because I didn't have the PhD. I had honorary degrees, I had plenty sort of awards that I didn't deserve. But so they created this position, but they didn't know where to put me. Was it gonna be in the Batten School of Public Policy, at the Darden Business School, the Arts and Sciences? What would it be, Religious Studies, Political Science? So I sort of am a sort of a professor of practice who runs across many of those um, disciplines. And as we know in universities, they end up being in silos. So I appreciated the earlier conversation about what does transdisciplinary look like? What does it mean to put flourishing at the center, like ecology, as you did? And how do you bring in, not just in our universities, but across the globe, trans academia, trans business, trans government, et cetera. So I wanted to like open up by saying, as I teach at UVA, I had to learn how to, I like say, trick the system to do the right thing. It wasn't so free to like talk about my Judaic studies, like training, but we were looking at a class called Religion, Violence, and Strategy, which I teach how to stop killing in the name of God. So you take an impossible topic, like the Uyghurs in China, the Yazidis in Iraq, the Rohingya in Myanmar, you know, the Coptics, the Armenians. You take where religion-related violence is the fastest growing violence in the world, and most of my students at UVA have never you know, sort of read the Bible, but also don't know how to spell those religious minorities around the world. So you take something way out of their ability to solve, or anyone's ability to solve, and that's when the question of strategy comes in. How do you teach these next generation of rising students the ability to become what I call transpreneurs or mini transformers? And I insist that in fact you can do this if you trigger an epiphany or an aha sort of before and after, you know, may I say a spiritual moment where they're like, oh, I can do this? So they're facing daunting challenges. We start to look at like 4 million graduates this year, just in the United States alone, who are looking like into a jobless market or so many undervalued and underemployed PhDs. Where are they going? How do we prevent a tsunami um, in this time of crisis of psychosocial proportions that leave rising generations and those who are unemployed depressed, angry, resentful, and sort of wallowing in victimhood and violence? This is a huge cha collective challenge for all of us, even outside academia, of course. So I'm gonna take a moment and walk you through, you know, once COVID hit, and I was thinking about the techniques I used in my class to sort of raise awareness and, and awaken the 60 students each semester. And I've been doing this for about six years now. Um, the COVID hit and I had a small cohort of international friends from India to Israel to Japan to like, you know, a farm in Wisconsin and shaman indigenous folk. And we said, what is it that is being called for online? How could we create some type of protocol or self-perpetuating wisdom and learning for to raise up a new generation of leaders to address the biggest issues of our day, which we were defining as ecocide, religious side or genocide, but also mass suicide, rising you know, mental health crises and depression around the world, and then this, this thorny issue of facticide, you know, infocide, like where we aren't getting truth in media or sometimes in academia. So how do we use the different sectors to advance our um, collective goals to sort of save the planet and its people? So I'm gonna press with your permission, share screen, and see if I can pull this up for you. Um, there. So I'm hoping this works, if I can finally get the right. It does, we can see it. Okay, good. So I think just like ecology at the center, we put the impact, like you start to think the students at the center, but we want flourishing students, right? Who understand how to align their whole holistic self, the whole person of their mind and their body and their heart. 
and also collective action or spirit. So what does flourishing look like for the world, for ecology, for people, for individuals? And so the philosophy is that you have to be simultaneously working on the inside transformation as well as the outside of transformation. So this is sort of the new thought for this spring. And again, this isn't like some big science project or I haven't spent 10 years on this. It's just based on instinct and trying to, as I said, expedite aha moments to give the faith and equipment for rising leaders to help change the world and believe that they can. I didn't, when I was younger, have any idea how to negotiate treaties. I had no idea how to climb out a minefield. I had no, like nothing in school actually trained me, even my MBA at Michigan trained me to actually like do what I ended up doing in life. So I'm trying to bring that sensibility as um, a professor, but also really, um, I would say an executive producer of change, trying to cast these students in the new play. So transpreneurship, like what the heck is that? Well, it's just a made up word basically to say instead of cutting across entrepreneurship, you know, our, this problem of jobs, jobs and jobs and meaningful work and purpose is critical. So I started to see as a social entrepreneur and a senior Ashoka fellow that there were really limitations in the social entrepreneurship space, in the business entrepreneurship space. So I thought, is there a way, and these, these, the different languages that the sectors use don't really connect. So I thought, how can we be values-based and stand in our care and reverence and balance? Pick your three values, your strongest ones as, Je as Jesuits. You know, that could be conscience and competence and you know, compassion, whatever it may be. Courage, I think, is actually needed when we think of um, our president at Fordham and what he talks about in terms of the five C's. But also your principles of collaboration, regeneration, and alignment with nature and indigenous wisdom and practice. So we're trying to coalesce and get people to understand. So the, yes, of course you should know at business school like what a dot com is. You're gonna become an entrepreneur, but you also might join a bigger system, a government or an IBM, a large company, and you become an intrapreneur. You still have to shift with your passion for change inside these big systems. That's a skill as well. And then entrepreneurs is like what I did when we created the international campaign to ban landmines. That was 1,200 organizations in over 120 countries who worked to create the mine ban treaty and get eradicate this weapon. There was 80 million landmines in over 80 countries. This was a global humanitarian disaster. So we had some practice with that. And I thought that's entrepreneurship. I share in the Nobel Peace Prize. I didn't receive it, but I was one of the leaders to organize survivors of landmines and victims in these communities to rise up and raise their voice and speak truth to power in governments and pentagons and, and military establishments to say enough. We must take responsibility for this military litter that is killing you know, too many people. 80% are actually civilians. So entrepreneurs, that's sort of in the .org and the coalition space, the nonprofit space. How do you build coalitions to increase your power for change? And then entrepreneurs, this is sort of the missing piece, but it's starting to show up here and there. That's where you could say it's the religious sector, or the monkish sector, the Jesuit sector, but also the academic sector. How do we work mindfully in our learning and action environments and what we're trying to do in the world? So these are just sort of concepts I'm throwing out. We're trying to class across them. I'm not saying this isn't already done out there. I'm just trying to put it together that the art of transpreneurship can be a way to teach people who may not have a specific um, you know, language or tradition they're coming from. And that's what I'm finding around the world, that people are from all different traditions. I have to find a way to communicate. And so I use language of wisdom, understanding, and knowledge. That might be for like the Abrahamics, how to align and be anointed in transformational leadership. But also when it comes to like Indian and other ones, I'll do like, what are the, the chakras? How do you align chakras on the planet and collective energies inside ourselves as well as in society to affect change? So this is about rising leaders working daily on the inner and outer transformation. One doesn't go without the other. You're aligning your you know, heart, mind, and body, or you know, you know, the Gandhian way. This is actually like across all different countries and cultures. You might say your heart, your mind, or your spirit, or your hands. And then not just to be like a yoga master, an individual who becomes like enlightened, but for social or collective impact. That's key in terms of the type of teaching and invitation we are trying to do together. And then I think the, re the responsibility of leaders really boils down to what my mentor says is three main things. You know, listen deeply, speak, communicate responsibly with integrity and even courage, and shift disempowering conversations. 
that means address the injustice around the world and build coalitions for transformation together because no one survives alone and no one can do this alone, period. So we're looking at what are the, like, the issues around the world where we need to design system shifts. So we have sort of a notional theory of change that instead of doing all the SDGs, which is not a strategy blueprint or even architecture for change, it's like playing Jeopardy, like I'll take peace and justice for 500, I'll take, you know, whatever, like climate or water for 300. We start to believe that the Paris Treaty or the Sustainable Development Goals, however important, are strategies and they are not. You know, strategy is the art and science of creating power to affect lasting and enduring change in the face of conflict and, you know, insecurity and lots of uncertainty and volatility that we're facing right now in terms of pandemics and other crises of climate, et cetera. So we're about how do you mobilize people with diverse capital? And business schools have focused way too much on financial capital. So what are the other capitals, the other chakras, the other energy centers, natural capitals, creative capitals, cultural capital, spiritual capital? How do you actually catch those up for this holistic education of the whole person and our students? It's like going to the gym. If we go ahead and get an MBA, I got one, and you sort of just keep playing, you know, exercising your bicep nonstop, and you think it's about capitalism and money, and that's sort of like a metric for success. No, it's a disaster. So unless we reintroduce balance into the chakra system, into the wisdom, understanding, and knowledge of the Abrahamics, into like Mother Earth and, and nature, we're ruined. So how do we get beyond like ESG, sustainable development goals, all these lovely things and acronyms and translate acronyms into action? So we started to look at the areas where we think non negotiable like you have to move the dials on these things, food and farming and soil, and make it really individual, like what you, each of us eat and drink and how, what choices we make and what chemicals we put in the body that burns us up while we burn the planet up. We want to start to look towards chemical-free zones. What would that look like? Fashion reform. Sounds sort of shallow, but fashion cuts across all of the SDGs. And that's one of the reasons why at Fordham in our Responsible Business Coalition that you heard about from Dean Donna yesterday was actually, what does it mean to reform this industry across the board and make ESG management principles, among other things, a bigger and sort of global issue? What we choose to wear, buy, consume, want, that's sort of the chakra of sort of um, fire, let's say. Personal power as well goes to finance reform. If we don't have a more conscious capitalism and look at what do we buy and sell each day? And what do we have faith in in terms of the metrics of money and capital? And then I would add like in the sort of the fifth chakra, thinking about like philanthropy reform, what we give and share. How do we show up with our families and the family of humanity? What is our service? to, again, this relocalized economy, where you live, what do you give and share? And then back to that addressing facticide and info side, how do we look for truth in media and advertising? You know, these are trillion dollar industries left and right, and we have to think, how are we, and, and the education sector, how do we reform how we're teaching, what we're thinking, you know, sort of rhetoric, logic, and communication? So lastly, sort of to sum up on this space, and again, there's nothing, you know, these are things that we've learned and I'm trying to translate into to ways that almost any country or any, you could do this in actually like seven sessions, you know, in seven 70 minute sessions over seven weeks. Again, to my point of, I don't have seven years, I don't feel for myself. So how do we expedite the epiphanies of system change? So transpreneurship is just a way of, you know, being rooted in your spiritual and your core values inside and out addressing root causes, not just symptoms, or putting all the isms at the center that we think we're going to solve. But how do we solve these societal problems with enduring or lasting or quote unquote sustainable impact? I think it's more regeneration and regenerative impact is more important for us to be looking at than the question of sustainability, which the business schools have moved towards in businesses in their comfort zone, but implies actually just sort of improvements and iterations on the status quo. And also we're hearing a lot of desire to return to how things were before COVID. There's no going back, I believe. And then how do we remove the enabling conditions for power abuse? We're seeing in a Black Lives Matter, looking at movements and how are they necessary but not sufficient to affect lasting change that will require budgets, practices, policies, policies and laws. 
And then how do we look at scale? And that's why I think it's so interesting to look at the faith-based communities, the Jesuit institutions, you know, as at least a starting point or one of the channels that is like authentic and credible and committed to excellence around the world and to the whole person. So to go back to our roots, like I said, sometimes I've gone to these universities and been despairing that like football became the center, you know, that's the idol and money or like Chinese tuitions coming in. They were like the, the, you know, the money of how we survived. So we have to look inside our hearts and inside our institutions to find alignment, not only just personally and individually, but collectively where we work. And we're trying to do that at Fordham and take a hard look at the Gabelli School of Business. How do you transform from traditional business to transformational leadership training, which gets beyond you know, some of the skill sets that we're like looking at. So I appreciate this conversation. We want to like build resilience. I think we're in for like a massive storm. This is not business as usual. So I invite comments and questions, but just just co or, or trans discussion on how we face what I think is fundamentally a spiritual and psychosocial tsunami crisis. Thank you. Thanks, thanks, Jerry. Uh, Michael, you want to follow? Okay, great. Yeah, I will. Well, thank you, Jerry. And I think uh, we want to ask everybody uh, to put the questions in. I'll present briefly about something that we did at Fordham, not claiming that this is the ultimate wisdom at all. It's just something that we can share uh, and also maybe use as a potential source of, of, uh, of conversation, like uh, the Healing Earth conversation and, and how that project was managed and uh, also the the aspiration that Jerry was sharing because I do think we have a huge opportunity if I may say so as a Jesuit network as a starting point to also collaborate build campaigns the way that Jerry was saying uh, that truly transcend the typical approach to education um, and and that um, and, and also how we create curriculum and and content so if I able to get this going myself. <laughs> okay. So what we did here and what we're hoping to also then start uh, in the workshops is to really focus on the core courses that we currently have. I think we all can agree that we need new courses. We need new curriculum. Also, that will take some time. What can we do within the existing structure? And so here, this is an example of uh, revising the introductory management course. And uh, we were guided by a number of, of uh, learning frameworks, like the four C's uh, in the document towards human excellence. Uh, the conscience, competence, compassion, commitment, and we sort of felt that we are very strongly focused on competences uh, and the conscience, compassion, commitment, or uh, courage uh, that uh, Jerry was mentioning. That's, that's not necessarily clear how that uh, comes out through our management course specifically. Um, then we had the Jesuit values and the Catholic social teaching principles. I'm, I'm throwing this out there as just a way for us to just use existing principles and language to inform how we teach dignity and the care for the whole person, solidarity as uh, serving men and women uh, with and for uh, being men and women with and for others, uh, subsidiarity to sort of as, as, well approach this notion of excellence. Uh, that we want to contribute more and better and, and really truly towards serving the common good, the stewardship for common home that also Pope Francis in Laudato Si was reminding us uh, forcefully. Now, I think uh, what we found interesting, even though in our group, very few people are Catholic, <laughs> uh, that these principles as framed as such are universal, as the original term Catholic uh, indicates so we were hoping and hopeful that this can be something that can uh, resonate with with students across uh, the spectrum we were also guided by these dimensions of learning of knowing doing and being and of course we're typically focused on the knowing part uh, sometimes we focus on doing 
and less so, at least in our case, we were thinking about what is the ultimate outcome? What's the being that we're enabling and, and how would we even do that in a traditional course? Um, the Ignatian pedagogy model that, that Father Garanzino was mentioning is sort of giving us setting context, experiencing in reflection, action, committing to action, and in evaluating that constantly. We were, we were trying to assess and do this, and uh, we're, we're not claiming that we found out how to do it, but I, I'll just want to present to you some of the things that we started with. And uh, here are the learning goals that we started with. We, we typically found that in our area, the professors have all kinds of learning goals, different potentially, but if they start with understanding, and then that's pretty much most of it. Understanding this, understanding that, understanding this, this, this. So it's all mostly in our context was going towards knowing. Uh, and it wasn't really much about doing and being. And I've sensed that that in many cases that could be the case as well. So I just want to flag this and, and uh, throw this out there. Uh, that was something that we, we understood. And I, I don't think that we have done a perfect job yet at really getting the current core course to do more of the doing and being part, but we have certainly been mindful and attentive to those issues. So um, I can go into some of those learning goals, but uh, you can see greater self-awareness of your strengths, values, and capabilities, sort of the inner, inner piece that Jerry was talking about, knowing yourself and purpose, which is sort of the encompassing knowing, doing, being a reflection that we, we hope to inspire continuously throughout the course, understanding the drivers of excellence. So in many ways, what we had been doing was just like teaching basic skills in negotiation or basic skills in communication, et cetera, et cetera. And of course, that's that's something that you can pull any HBR article for or something like that. But then we were mindful of trying to understand it's it's not about managing or communicating or negotiating just anything. We wanted to connect it with the excellence. What is the human excellence piece that we would want to negotiate for, communicate towards, and and uh, collaborate with? So we're bringing that into the context of the self to the group to the organization, to society. So the, the four step of Catholic social thought, the dignity at the individual level connected with the uh, solidarity and the subsidiarity and, and the common good as the ultimate goal. Uh, Jeffrey Sachs was talking about that and Father Augusto was talking about that as well yesterday. Of course, that requires the discernment and the guidance to be an ethically, socially minded leader based on those Jesuit values. And that's where we think the being piece is and can be addressed. So we have a lot of room for mindfulness and reflection and learning and, and evaluating there, but also want to make sure that it is connected, not just in an abstract way to the world outside, but the person, the student directly. So we'll have learning journeys and learning journals and all of those uh, things in there. Then uh, the ultimate goal is of course to develop this as a virtue, as a habit and, and a managerial skill that they can be out there in the world uh, to be change agents to contribute to a flourishing uh, world as Jerry was uh, suggesting as well. Um, I'm just sharing here how we then approach the, the change in a, in a pragmatic way. We had these learning goals, then we went, uh, which we called level zero, into a level one <clears throat> design, which was basically just saying, uh, we have 14 weeks in our semester. What is the storyline that we want to follow? And uh, so we started with the context, setting the context and, and answering the bigger question, why this course? Why is this course relevant? Is this course in any way uh, important to the student? I think we were answering a question that most of the students had because in a core course, they just have to take it. So we spend in the design two sessions on uh, why, on motivating and setting the context. So we're saying because you need it, actually as a student, you need it. And because the world needs it. And because in our context, students are working in teams, uh, your team will need it. And then we're basically setting out the modules and starting with the individual piece, the individual excellence, then towards team excellence, towards organizational excellence, and then towards societal excellence, and bringing it back at the very end of how each of the students that is going through the principles of management course can use the principles of management to contribute to 
team excellence, organizational excellence, societal excellence. And uh, that's the storyline that we created. We then basically developed each module in what we called level three development. And then each course in what we called the level three development and have granular course material. And when COVID hit in this whole process, we said, this is an, this is an opportunity for us to develop asynchronous material that we then can put in a learning system, which then also open up the possibility to say, if as a Jesuit group or community, we were to connect this, we could potentially develop material uh, much like Ignited offers cases, we could potentially develop film-based material, other asynchronous material that can be used for courses. So I, I am putting this link here and I'll put it in the chat just to share with you how, how what this, this course looks like or one of the, the, um, the classes. And uh, what we also saw, and I just wanted to leave, uh, leave you with, is that this approach has enabled us to create well, new ways of partnership and thinking about teaching. So this is not, not completely random, but I just thought this was inspiring to us. We were able to connect through this new approach of teaching business and management with a number of other organizations, including the UN. And, and uh, here, this what I'm sharing with you is uh, the cast of Sesame Street. And Sesame Street, as you know, has been using uh, asynchronous teaching material at scale for 40 or 50 years. And, and we were thinking we can potentially learn from them how to do this for business students. So this is a project and, and this is a, uh, just a screenshot of a, of a film that we produced as a, as a, a sample. Uh, where we use the approach of Sesame Street to teaching business students and to bring that content along. And uh, so this is just something that excites us at this point. And I think this may open up possibilities for, for maybe the Jesuit community or others to really partner with outside institutions that aren't typical partners in, in education, um, but uh, that can help us scale what Jerry was saying, maybe create the kind of... Uh, graduates that are mini transformers in in new ways um, so I'll, I'll leave you with that and uh, thank you for listening thank you let's 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 give a round of applause to our panelists in whatever way we can um, so uh, I have you know if you if you can if you can type your we do have some time for for questions so if you can type your questions in the chat we can we can take them and whilst you're doing that I just want to kind of uh, do a little promotion. So, so the IJBS meeting, which was to be held uh, in a, during this time in Odessa, has got postponed to next year. And Jose is over here. Jose, do you want to say anything about uh, that conference? It has postponed to next year. Yeah. You, you want me to say something about the old or the new conference? <laughs> no. Well, the old one has been postponed for natural reasons. To the summer of 2021, we had a very interesting program, but uh, the COVID had different plans for us, so we had to move the conference for next year. Of course, uh, we are expecting, hoping that the pandemics are going to be under control by then. And we will be preparing a wonderful conference for you to visit Guadalajara, Mexico during the summer and have chances to review all of what we have been doing during these two days of reflections. Hopefully there will be wonderful advances in um, curriculum design and other initiatives. So, we are moving towards that and we will truly will be notifying you how we are going but for now this all i can say nikki thanks thanks Jose. uh i see brent horton also we are uh, so the cjb conference next year is at fordham brent do you want to say a little bit uh, a little bit brent brent horton oh well okay he's uh 
Anyway, uh, so next is CJV conference is at uh, is at Fordham, and I'll put a flyer in the shared in the shared folder, and we'll send that to you. Uh, there was a, there was one question from the from the audience in terms of slides. I know this session is being recorded and will be shared, but uh, for the for the panelists, is it okay if uh, we make available the slides that uh, you're shared today to the to the general audience? Sure. Nancy, Mike, and okay, great, perfect. Thank you. Um, Okay, so let me take one, the first one, one question. So is the Healing Earth book also useful for non-formal education for small business leaders and entrepreneurs? Mike and Nancy? Yes, it is. As I mentioned earlier, uh, it's in a module form. So uh, there's six chapters, biodiversity, natural resources, or food. It's cutting off. Mike, you froze. Yeah, I think he's frozen. It looks good, and, though. That's a nice picture. Huh? Um, yeah. those, are, those are decisions they could make. We, we lost you. We lost you for a little while. So can you oh. can you just repeat it because you froze? The the the, the chapters. Yeah. The, the, uh, so if I was in a group, uh, you know, to decide what we would like to discuss, if there's issues in biodiversity, habitat fragmentation, species extinction, water, uh, the food system, uh, uh, global climate change, then you could go into the chapter. Now, let's see, do we want to explore some of the moral issues that are surfacing? Do we want to explore uh, the environmental justice movement on water? Uh, so it's easy to use in a modular way. Uh, it's a lot, it's a living textbook, so all the data is updated and, uh, uh, you know, fresh, so uh, that's a good thing. Great, thanks. Uh, I, I see, I see Ron uh, Nasser on the, on the call. Uh, Ron, uh, you were, you were provost at Presidio, right? Uh, let me see. Yes. Yes. Uh, Ron, uh, can I call, can I kind of put you on the spot a little bit over here in terms of, uh, we've been sharing a little bit about uh, the whole thing of uh, curriculum development, et cetera. What has been your experience uh, at Presidio? Because you try to, you'll try to kind of, uh, you know, develop a curriculum right from the kind of, from the start, right? Uh, yes, we, we did. And uh, first of all, I have to, I have to give credit to uh, my Loyola Academy uh, Notre Dame, uh, my Georgetown friends tell me I took a wrong turn then, uh, but after Kellogg, I went to Mundelein College and uh, studied about social justice and then uh, took that to uh, DePaul, uh, then uh, got my, my degree in moral philosophy at 55. They call me a late bloomer, uh, but what, what, we, what we did is I, I took the, this whole knowledge of, of inquiry and uh, what, what I did my, my PhD was in moral philosophy. And uh, uh, I met the founder of Presidio who had founded World College West. And any of you who are in educational background might know of that school. It was an experimental school founded by, the, um, by uh, Lawrence Rockefeller. And it was to educate global citizens. It was undergraduate and uh, very successful for a period of time. They then morphed into Presidio World College, and through research, uh, Dick Gray had been in advertising uh, and uh, knew about market orientation and found there was a need for an MBA in sustainable management. So we were the first MBA in sustainable management in the country, and we're told we were the first in the world. Now, the idea was known, but it would never have been packaged all around the MBA. And what we did is we developed around a simple idea, what is your big idea? Very simple. And we based it around this idea of discernment. And uh, uh, Mike uh, Shook is on the, on the call and my compatriot was uh, Scott Kelly, uh, who did his dissertation with Mike uh, on formal existential ethics in the thought of Ignatius Loyola, Bernard Lonergan, exemplified in the life of Dorothy Day. And so we looked at this and said, just like what you were talking about earlier with, with, with your, your program at Virginia and, um, and at Fordham, it was, we put them on an arc of inquiry. 
and where I ended up was uh, pragmatic inquiry, which we found lined up exactly with Lonergan's method in theology. And uh, we used this at, at Levi Strauss, and uh, the, the CA, CEO at Levi's at that time was a Georgetown graduate. And I sat with, with another uh, formerly ex-Jesuit, uh, Mike Stebbins, whom some of you might know at Seton Hall. Uh, we laid out, be attentive, be, uh, uh, be, be, be attentive, be intelligent, be reasonable, be responsible, be in love. We laid that out as an arc of inquiry. We said, all right, it's, a, it's the process of discernment. So what we've been working on is this idea where we are presently is uh, looking on this in terms of the spiritual exercises as they, are, as they, they morphed into Lonergan, uh, virtue ethics, and so we don't. We never start out with what are your values. We always say, what are you concerned about? What's the? What do you see? That'll tell you about even what your values are. But then it is to develop, uh, and we, we we take them through through all the MBA uh, uh, disciplines, uh, which we all know. But the thread through it all is a reflection of their arc of inquiry. What are they learning about what they are called to do next? And it culminates in a capstone which is their, their program to say, okay, here it is. And what we say in essence is that we've been, my big shock with uh, when I was at Mundelein, now part of Loyola, uh, was when I listened to the language of Gandhi and Meister Eckhart his, his lectures to the merchants of Cologne. I went, business language is sacred language. And we just have to reclaim this language as sacred. That's why that great, uh, and um, uh, David White claims it's not his, his idea, but someone came up to him one day and said, uh, the language of business is too small for its purpose. And I just love that idea of reclaiming the language of what's there. Like what you were saying earlier uh, about, uh, we've focused on just financial capital, it's human capital. That's why this, we, we are so pleased with uh, what Laudato Si and the whole tradition of Catholic social teaching has meant to us is that it's giving that kind of language, starting with Leo the Thirteenth and the Freiburg Union, and so we have this great tradition, and we just have to now reclaim it in the best language. It goes right to the heart of it: is economics and strategy. And I want to know uh, back to you, Mr. White, what you gave a definition of strategy, which I thought was brilliant, and I please put that in somewhere because that's all it is: is saying what do humans do uh, in order to serve the common good. I'll leave you with this. I just got a note. We're, we're redoing the, the curriculum at, um, uh, at uh, Presidio, and we've always felt that the most important strand, we've all said, is the human development strand. So I'm working with a woman, uh, Elizabeth Doty, and she was three years at the Safra Fellowship at uh, Harvard after Harvard Business School. And she's a great friend of this, uh, Rebecca Henderson. If you're familiar with her whole work on capitalism in a world on fire and their work on reimagining capitalism at the Harvard Business School. She just sent me a note, we're working on, the, on various ways of the curriculum, asking me what the, the, founding, um, uh, the founding vision was. And Father Garanzini, that's the book that I sent to you, by the way, I hope you got it. Uh, Journeys to Oxford, it's got, this got in two pages, which I'll be happy to share with all of you. In two pages, we put down what the pillars were. And it was my best attempt at Lonergan uh, in business education was our goal. Well, anyway, so I get this note from this woman who's working real time in the curriculum and she knows all this stuff. And she says, are you familiar with Chardin? I went, uh, yeah. And so now, and uh, on, the, on the call too is, is my colleague from, from Presidio, uh, Dwight Collins. And he's been working with uh, David Sloan Wilson, whom I know is working with you all at, uh, at Gabelli on this pro-social. I'll conclude with this. The biggest story is all, of what larger story are we a part? We all know that. Uh, Alistair McIntyre's great uh, after virtue, uh, desire, practical reasoning, narrative. And uh, Dwight has been trying to bring in uh, the work of uh, David Christensen and the Big Bang. And we, so we've been working with uh, uh, the um, uh, Mary Evelyn Tucker and John Grimes at Yale on the big story, Thomas Berry. So we're saying, take the Chardin, this is the largest story we can tell you. The biggest story we can tell you is that we are, the, the, the universe is a big bang, 
of divine love. And the Jesuits, I, I, and the, the reason why I'm still a Catholic today is because of Catholic social tradition. And the, as my, my, my friend uh, tells me, he said, I'm not Catholic, I'm Jesuit. And uh, that's always been sort of our, our thought. Uh, you gave a good uh, d joke this morning, by the way. I thought it was a good joke. Uh, the, so, so what we're trying to say is the student comes in and we say, okay, you're a part of this larger story. We, have ch we all know we've chunked it down to these little pieces. And what the opportunity at Presidio was, and uh, uh, Hunter mentioned it yesterday, she was part of the core faculty too, was that essentially it was interdisciplinary, woven together, just like you described with your circles before. And we say the thread through it is, um, is this arc of inquiry and we can find no better all we've done is is to put into business language method and theology and i found the best people to do that were the pragmatists first royce james dewey uh whitehead were chicago people john dewey and jane adams essentially were the big spark plugs for the progressive era as you know and we're going through another progressive era again these are, I, I find myself saying over, these are not new problems. We've had these same issues forever. Look at Harvard, and they've been trying to talk about this since they founded in 1908. I've got a whole chapter on that. We followed um, uh, a lot of the commentary. I'll, I'll conclude on that if I can be of any more help, but we've lived this experience now. I brought it to DePaul. Uh, we, we've talked with Kevin Stevens uh, briefly about this, but essentially we feel that it is to take this language that has been there and repurposing it relanguaging it and it runs right directly at economics and business. I'll conclude with the diagram. Marketing is the way that economics enters society. That's a great definition. And advertising is its voice. And I'm saying that's the heart of the language we work on. So I'll conclude on that. I'm very thanks, grateful. Thanks, Raman, and thanks for being here. Um, there was a question for, uh, for Jerry uh, and the question was, um, you know, you said you learn to create epiphanies for students before you approach uh, usually complex content. How do you do this uh, using your framework? So just quickly, like that we teach on strategy as this art of creating power that uh, take the book of Genesis, like it's God is the great strategist. So there's something going on. There has to be an affirmative vision of creation of this human experiment that goes so terribly complicated. So you start with um, you know, the first day of strategy creation of the six days where the seventh day is the Sabbath rest and this sort of vision for uh, creation. The first day is vision and values. That's the first step of strategy creation. And so you start with the students having to actually do a classic psychosocial projection. It's very basic and I can sort of, you can expedite it fast and like literally in 45 minutes you can have moved whole classes of students to a new awareness of themselves. Who's your hero? Who do you admire most? What's an icon? It just can't be a family member. And then they may pick Pope Francis, Mother Teresa, Princess Diana, or like a superpower or like a, someone from fiction in a book. It doesn't matter. So um, you have them move to that person. Then you get them into an energetic exercise of what are the three qualities you most admire in that person that resonate with you? Like, do you know them? Why are you, you know, why do you love them so much? And you move those not just, well, they're, they're diligent or they're hardworking or they're brilliant. Those are lesser, what I would call knowledge answers. We're trying to get at the wisdom essence of like the virtues and values that are inherent in their projection. So they may be say justice, peace, um, patience, love, compassion. And they pick three. I only say like three because it's like a Trinitarian sort of approach, but it also, you have to keep it simple. Once they land on those three, the aha moment is like, do you understand you just, I now know you. I know your soul's DNA and why you're here in terms of like you projected onto that canvas of an icon you don't know. That's what we do for icons, whether saints or Jesus or whomever, we project onto them like our favorite qualities. Then you start working with, I would say that their sort of soul and sort of leadership paints, that those three qualities will show up wherever they work, whether at an embassy, you know, for the US government or the State Department, or at Starbucks, or during their day-to-day -day walk on campus? Are they being who they are with their deepest superpower that has been graced to them, that's transcendent, that goes beyond what they own? These are indivisible qualities. So you just play a pretty quick projection game with some of the students, and then you work that into their um, projects going forward. Does that make sense? Yep. 
there was another question for you, Jerry, a follow-up question in terms of, you know, uh, what, what, what steps uh, are needed to develop kind of a global movement uh, that would overcome some of the artificial barriers that we face? I mean, one of the things I'm, you know, one of my mentors is Monica Sharma, who's writing a lot about trans radical transformational leadership. Um, and so she taught at the UN for a number of years. So, but you sort of step back and one of the things you can put, like, if you find a problem like ecocide or racism or sexism or all the different awful things, most people either put their organization at the center or they put the ism, the problem they're addressing. But the problem is symptomatic of a series of other things. And in fact, it doesn't work. So you have to start with an affirmative vision and value set as your starting point. That's why I put flourishing at the center. What would flourishing look like? You could put other things at the center depending on what issue you want to tackle or what coalition you're building. And then you learn how to, I would say, it's like putting on a play, how to executive produce live action for impact. So it's like an opera. In the first act, you have all these different characters being introduced, like the landmine example. It was like putting on a play with characters. You have this disaster, 80 million landmines in over 80 countries. 80% of the victims are civilian, not soldiers. So you have a humanitarian disaster problem. And then you think, well, what's a vision for like a world without landmines where you can walk freely and you know, people can be safe and people are accountable? What does that look like for values? And then you start to see that people cast themselves in the play. There are academics who want to study it and monitor and evaluate the movement. There are the survivors who are passionate to tell their, give their testimony for the movement. There's the lawyers that you need to draft legal items and argue for advocacy points, like on international treaty negotiations. So you keep inviting people to cast themselves in the play while you get through that first act, which is sort of messy and setting up all the characters. The second act for Landmines was like, okay, oh my gosh, we're gonna go build a treaty. Like we have a partnership with the, 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 in Ottawa and government and they want to like do this with us. And we're gonna do it differently. It's exciting, the second act. You take it outside the UN, and in one year, you're gonna negotiate a treaty in partnership with civil society and governments. And then oh, at the closing part of the second act of this grand landmine opera, the Princess of Wales enters the stage. No one sees that coming. She casts herself in the play. I help script and produce that moment so she is able to be meeting survivors and become the humanitarian, compassionate, gifted leader that she was transcendental. And then at the end of the second act, oh my God, the princess is suddenly dead. It's 1997. She wasn't, she was the leading lady. How can she die in this, this drama? And then the third act is, well, we get back to it and we all come together across sectors, you know, to negotiate a treaty to forever ban the production, stockpile, use, um, and export of, of landmines, among other things, while helping the victims among, and doing humanitarian provisions and destroying of stockpiles. So this, I'm just trying to give you an arc. It starts with, there's, a, there's an art to it, but think of it more like executing a drama or as Larry Friedman at Oxford says, like strategy is like a story told in the future tense. You're imagining, your vision and values, your first step of creation is what's the world we want? A mind-free, barrier-free, victim-free world. Okay then, what values are we like bringing to the table so we can bring that through consistently? And then what do we do in terms of understanding paradigm shifts and language and laws and policies worldwide? And the, so this alignment of wisdom, understanding and knowledge is absolutely critical for transformational leadership, not just management. <coughs> I think we're like, you know, need to get beyond just thinking about tools and tricks and knowledge trade if we really want to address these, these chronic complex problems. Thanks, Jerry. I'm going to take uh, just one last question, and that's to Michael Shook. Uh, you know, when we, when we, uh, the question was, when we think of uh, ecology and theology, and especially given our uh, um, Jesuit institutions, often the framework we think of is in a Catholic, uh, in a Catholic kind of uh, framework and Catholic theology. But a lot of our institutions have uh, people from different faith traditions, and kind of like you know, so. Could you, could you address in terms of, you know, how do you see the spirituality component as uh, uh, kind of embracing other, other faith traditions as well? well? I think the basis of uh, the tradition is essentially, and, and I think no, mo most of you know this, it's an Aristotelian um, kind of metaphysical claim that, that um, there are objective values uh, with which we strive, to which we strive, and those objective values we seek, um, 
um, we desire. So uh, Ron mentioned Lonergan. Uh, that's a great framework that's not aligned to any specific religious or spiritual tradition, but simply says in our own in internal dynamic of thinking, we move from experience to understanding to judgment to action. And that movement is, a, is an intentionality. There's, a, there's an intentionality inside of all of us that, that is a, a really universal and independent of any particular religious or spiritual tradition. And that's been, the, I think, the feat of Catholic social teaching and its broad reach is that it, it, it um, clearly the theological dimension is, is vital for people uh, that want to pray through this and, and worship and ritualize this. Um, uh, but, but the metaphysic and the groundwork is, is universal. Now, the, the argument is, are there such things as these universal values and objective values? Uh, and and uh, I don't think there's, I don't know of anyone in my philosophy department at Loyola University that believes that such things exist. So um, if you are, in, you know, if you are taking on this, this idea of fulfillment, of, uh, of an intentionality toward basic goods, um, you're not going to get a lot of uh, support in contemporary philosophy. Every, everything is, you know, very strongly social constructivist. So the work that needs to be done is a validation of that claim. Uh, and and uh, sometimes what happens is we too easily talk about fulfillment and it begins to sound like a book from the self-help collection at, you know, at Barnes and Noble. The, um, this fulfillment is, is, a, is a very argued concept <laughs> in terms of its objective reference. Thanks, thanks Mike. Uh, so I'm going to turn it over to uh, Michael Pearson, who's kind of, he's already, I can see he's already posted all the Zoom links for the different workshops in the chat. Um, and uh, I'm going to turn it over to him to kind of uh, just give us a little bit of, uh, of what we are going to be doing and also kind of remind us that we are going to be reconvening back after the workshops. Michael? Well, thank you, Nikki, and, and thank you all for being here. We're going to take a, a short break, well, short break, half an hour break. And uh, I put in the chat the information that you also have or should have received if you had registered through the Ignited site uh, in terms of the workshops. We, are, we ask you to self-select into those working groups. And the charge is that we have had teams and workshop leaders uh, in teams prepare a level zero and a level one draft. And uh, this draft is in the shared folder that we also shared. So we ask you to come back at 11 uh, for the conversation in the area that you feel most attracted to. We have the functional areas that we think will benefit from redesign. And we have one area which is about new courses and a conversation about potentially new programs as well. So please check out the email. I also put the information in the chat. Um, I thank you all for being here and I'm going to ask the workshop leaders to stay on for a moment so that we can coordinate. Okay, so thank you all. Thank you to the panelists. Thank you, Nikki. Uh, uh, thank you um, for being here with us and hope to see many of you uh, momentarily. We'll close with a conversation about next steps uh, until one o'clock Eastern Standard Time. Okay, so thank you. We're ready, Mike. Okay, wonderful.
Um, so do, are you all feeling comfortable in terms of getting and hosting the link in uh, Zoom? No. <laughs> no. <laughs> so, so, and, and Michael, I'll tell you why, because I, I had difficulty getting on this morning. I tried to go to the conference website. I had to re-register again. My, my, I reset my password, all of which was pretty surreal. So if, if you can just give us the, the Zoom, and this is a fail-safe, foolproof suggestion, just give us the Zoom link and the password for our individual sessions. That would certainly be helpful to me and perhaps to others. That's I just put, I just that's put the it in the chat. Uh, oh, okay. I hope you can find that. Okay. Uh, yeah. And, uh, and I know you can't really test it now. There's a password each time, okay? Uh, and if you're now testing it, then you'll have to log on, or log off from this session, right? So I'll ask you to, that if, we, if we can clarify this, I'll stay on this link. And if you cannot make the other link work, please come back to this one. Okay. And uh, yeah. Nikki and Jose and... Um, David and myself, we have access apparently or hosting rights in each of the rooms, but we also have commitments to some of the rooms, so we're not super flexible. But if you can uh, send us a message or uh, um, test it out before so that we can make sure we, 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 want, we want to come by each of the rooms just to make sure that the technical piece is working. Um, Jake, are you okay? I see you here. You were also shaking your head about accessing the information. Uh, I'm, I'm okay, Michael. Um, do you want us to test the Zoom links now or uh, not get yet. through some not stuff? Yet. Later, because then you have to log out of here. So Michael, um, as we go to the other uh, Zoom space, um, how will we be partialed into marketing operations, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera? So if you, I'm not sure. Did you receive the email that uh, Tracy sent out or the, the chat? I, can you see the chat? Because we, we basically provided a separate link for each discipline. So marketing here. Let me just find it. Well, I am looking at I only see one entry here. Right. Well, and that's your whole room. That's whole. Everybody that selects to go there is going to be for you for marketing. Okay. And then there's a separate then, room for economics. And then Cliff, if you don't feel comfortable with uh, like you know being the host, you can always appoint a co-host or an alternate host. Uh, I'll I'll come I'll come into the I'll come into the room and help you with that. Yeah, I think uh, the the two Stacys and I were going to have this kind of division of labor. I'll, uh, I'll sort of lead, but they're going to work with the slides and so on. Sure. Yeah. Are you are you going to be with us? You're going to be. Yeah, I just I, I'll 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 come I'll come in for for a while. And just. Mm -hmm. you know. <clears throat> One question, the timing, what time should we come back to the plenary? Uh, so 12.30, we want to start the plenary, which is 12.30 uh, New York 12 time. With 12, uh, yeah, it would be okay, 6 yes. your time, right? So, so maybe give okay. it five minutes for people to change. Okay, Francisco says that his, his link is working, so I'm glad to hear that. Um, mm -hmm. So and my link is also my link is also working, and there is already some people in. Super. Okay. Great. Great. So <laughs> we don't want to hold you from that, uh, and I just want to also just make sure that you have clarity on on the charge because reporting out the reporting out that we were trying to do is three minutes <laughs> per group. And ideally focused on, and, and Jose will manage, Jose, maybe you want to talk about, that. but just to, to, to um, share the, the ambition or the hope that you have a level zero learning goals thing that's sort of approved by the group that you work with and a level one storyline that's quote unquote sort of approved by the group. That's, that's all. And maybe you can get there very quickly or maybe you can get there, uh, it, it, you can't get there. But that's the aspiration, and then maybe you can share what else you have. In case you guys are very fast and say this is, then you can potentially think about what are next steps. What does a level two look like? 
in granularity if you wanted to develop it. Maybe you can share experiences uh, in terms of what has worked, what doesn't work. Um, but at least if you can, have level zero and level one uh, ready to share. And the afterwards, we'll be using this as a stepping stone also for fundraising for uh, next steps in terms of the whole process of developing those courses. This is a background. Yeah. In my in my opinion, Mike, um, if we are if we if we are modest in in what we can achieve, because the groups will be larger than we thought, uh, and there will be many people there who have a, a, no uh, previous knowledge of what we are doing here. I guess the groups. Uh, can do as far as they can go. A, for me, it is very important to initiate collaboration, for instance, and set the principles of collaboration. We are forming the group. We're constituting a group. So it would be very hard to initiate with the task itself of crafting learning goals. So you have to be in that respect, very sensible to the group that is going to be around you and say, hey, we are here to do uh, recreating business curricula that we have to know each other first. We have to set the principles of collaboration, expectations, and so on. So if you have chance to get into crafting learning goals, that would be marvelous, right? So don't push yourself to too much. We are not expecting anything very concrete, but certainly forming the group, perhaps a sharing impressions of how to do the, 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 the new design of the curricula, and then perhaps going into learning goals. If you can go and build a common storyline for the course, that would be wonderful. Remember, we are only having a couple of minutes um, when we concur to the main link, a couple of minutes to share what we have done. So be prepared to just take two minutes, otherwise we're gonna need more time or lift some groups out of um, uh, sharing. So for that reason, we're gonna be very strict about having only two and a half minutes Maximum three minutes, please. And, and good luck. What else? Well, I, well, just one other thought is um, if you can, and, and let's say it's not going to be like 100 people in your group, <laughs> which would in itself be great. But uh, if it's a smaller group and manageable, if you can ask at some point who would want to be part of a continuing conversation so that we can already use this as an opportunity to identify uh, groups for a follow-up, it'd be, it'd be great. Um, Are there any other questions? Michael and Nikki, this is Steve Port. Uh, Molly Pepper and I are doing the new courses, so we don't have anything to share. But what we will do is um, elicit ideas on potential new courses and then take, um, see if we can get any uh, champions or leaders who would be willing to drive those. So that's what our plan was. Yeah, so Steve, so just to give you, a, give you a heads up, you already have something in your shared folder. You have already two, you have uh, James Stoner who has put something in, as well as Gonzalo who uh, has got something on social economy. So you already, uh, you already have some stuff in the, in the shared folder and already people who are uh, in that group. Okay, Nikki, good. Thanks for the heads up. I didn't know that. Nikki, I don't think we all have access to that shared folder. I just sent you a note. I don't think we all have the link to that yet. I had, uh, I, can, I can send it again. Uh, yeah, to the chat, please. Yeah. I think it's in the email of Tracy. It says there, the, it, it, it doesn't say folder, but it says institutional paradigm or something like that. It's in the email of Tracy. Yeah. Um, 
I'm I'm putting it right over here again uh, for so for y'all if y'all want to just one minute. Yes, I see in the email from Tracy that there is a link for the uh, so I put, Thank I, you. I put, I put the link. I put the link again in the in the chat. Okay. Yeah. So. There was a question, uh, Jake. Just a question on next steps. Uh, we may be asked, will this document, where will this document go? Uh, how do we collaborate moving forward? Are there any instructions we can pass on to them? So there are just some aspirations <laughs> because uh, we're, we're not clear. We weren't clear that this works and maybe it works and maybe it doesn't work. So if it doesn't work, it doesn't work. That's also okay. We test it this way, but let's assume it works and there's interest and people want to continue the conversation. I think then we would want to know that we find who can be part of that. Can you hear me well? It says my internet connection. Um, um, Mike, Mike, you, you are, Mike, you are breaking up. You're, you're getting frozen. Mm. So I apologize. Mike, bad connection. Okay. So uh, if it is successful and if you have people that want to work and continue to work, uh, it, it'd be great as a next step to just have those people there. And then we hope, I think maybe Jose and, and Nikki and, and David and, and others will figure out a way how to continue that. I know that we have put out feelers for additional fundraising, et cetera, to get to support this work. And another option is that Ignite it, the platform is very willing to support potentially the distribution of some of the materials that can be created if if we decide to do that. Um, but yeah, those are just options. And if you have and if you have time to discuss that, uh, it'd be good to just collect some ideas of what could next steps be. Is there any, any other question or comment, recommendation? Yeah, and Nikki, I have a follow-up. I, I just saw, I went to the link that you just shared and I saw what uh, was shared in the new courses um, from Jim Stoner. Yeah. Did you say there was a second one? Uh, Gonzalo, he'll be, he'll be joining y'all. He said he had put it, but I didn't see it. No, I think there, there's another folder, but uh, I, I'm going to put it, Stephen, no worry, right now. Oh, okay. Was that the one on social economy? Yes. Yes. Okay. There's a separate uh, file for that. So yeah. I'll, I'll take a look at that one as well. All right. Thank you. And, and Mauricio is asking a question that may be of importance to everybody. If you have a lot of people and you want to make groups, I think you should be able to have breakout groups. Mm -hmm. Did I come through? Yes, yeah, they should be able to, they, they should be able to get into breakout groups if they want to, if the group is too big. Yes. Like, you know, so even in the new, in the new courses, if they want to kind of have a group for social economy or for some other things, that's fine. They can do that. Okay, let's okay. take a little break and, and get into your, yes. get into your groups. <laughs> yeah, let's get some. All right. Help. Thank you all. You. I'll, I'll close. Good luck all. Thank you.